come to our session on um, ethics. And um, this afternoon session will be a, um, a, a lecture on the ethics of COVID-19 vaccination. And to deliver this um, lecture is Dr. Divine Manubala. Dr. Divine Manubala is a, is a physician by primary training and also a legal practitioner. He holds a master's and PhD degrees in bioethics and medical jurisprudence from the School of Law, University of Manchester. And he's done a lot of work in healthcare, ethics and law, health policy, professional regulation, ethics, education, research ethics, and ethics governance. He was the one who first set up the um, Ghana's medical legal department, the Ministry of Health. And over there, he helped institutionalize ethics and law into healthcare training, practice and policy. He has also consulted for the West African Health Organization on national research ethics governance for the West African sub-region. Dr. Bambala is currently the acting registrar of the Medical and Dental Council of Ghana, a member of the legal committee of the Ministry of Health and the legal committee of the Association of Medical Councils of Africa. He's a management committee member of the Association of Medical Councils of Africa and a member of the board of directors of the International Association of Medical Regula Regulatory Authorities. I guess with this background, Divine is obviously um, the most appropriate person to give us this lecture on the ethics of COVID-19 vaccination. So without wasting much time, Divine, I'll hand over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Prof, for your kind words. And uh, I wish to express my appreciation uh, to the college uh, that I'm here to be able to share a few thoughts with colleagues about some ethical legal considerations around our very vexed subject of COVID-19 vaccines or vaccinations. And my first disclaimer is that I'm just running in from parliament. So uh, if the thoughts are not as sharp as they are expected to be, uh, you will understand that I'm running on a half well tank. The second one is that this is a, a conversation largely in ethics and law, and therefore it is not intended to be, and I, I will ensure it does not become a technical conversation around uh, vaccination because I, ha I have no pretense at all, that I have no competence at all to deal with the technical components of vaccinations. So in terms of outline, I I'll provide some brief background. Uh, we'll look at the challenge that confronted us as a, a, a human population. Then we'll look at the initial responses that were undertaken across the globe. I have conversations around some thoughts around certainty and uncertainty. Then I've decided to focus this le lecture deliberately around vaccine mandates, because that is where all the conversations around the world are. And then we'll look at the ethics of it and then the law. In terms of the ethics, uh, because the lecture is largely about the ethics of vaccinations, I'll be deliberately detailed there but focusing largely on the principles that underpin the ethical and legal considerations that inform public policy. And of course, uh, I'll be sharing with you some concluding remarks. So in respect of background, we faced a huge, the global community faced a huge challenge. Around the tail end of 2019, a novel pathogen crept upon us. And we later found that that was SARS-CoV-2, commonly referred to as COVID-19. And unsurprisingly, our human populations have no specific or any pre-existing immunity against the new pathogen. It therefore presented a real and very serious existential threat to the human population. 
Luckily, with a combination of brilliance, will, zeal, and technology, vaccines were developed at a decently fast pace. And we would have thought that Eureka, our savior, has arrived. Unfortunately for us, a second challenge showed up. And this challenge showed up in two forms. The first form as vaccine hesitancy. And the second one as completely against vaccines. Now popularly, the catchphrase is anti-vax, anti-vax. So the hesitancy uh, technically is just a delay of acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite the availability of vaccination services. And to be fair, this is not a local problem, it's a worldwide problem, which predates our COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not going to bore us in going into uh, the history of those things. And also to just largely indicate that many of the people who may be hesitant are not necessarily ideologically opposed to taking vaccines. And also, they are not necessarily against science or anti-science. In fact, hesitancy is usually around managing risks. Uh, do we trust the process because these vaccines came in too quickly? And at the time that we were beginning to roll them across the world, some of them only had passed uh, emergency authorization and the full uh, approvals hadn't come in. And therefore, some of this was as a result of the doubt in the context of uncertainty. And therefore, hesitancy in that second leg should be seen as some people trying to talk back to science about concerns that they feel need to be addressed or uh, remain unaddressed. But this group are completely different from those that are anti-science, anti-vaccinations, and which led to a global movement called anti-vax movement, either fueled by the modern day social media information uh, communication technology or itself becoming infodemic. The global response initially was non-pharmacological and these interventions were liberty limited, public health measures. So we described them from social distancing to non-physical distancing, personal protective equipment mandates, wearing masks and things like that. Then there were restrictions on public movement and closures of businesses, both in the private and the public sectors. Now, all of these non-pharmacological liberty limiting uh, public health measures proved to be effective in the short to medium term. But it is undeniable that given even our own local experiential uh, events, they come with significant and unsustainable impacts on our socioeconomic circumstances. In fact, when we shut down this country for a greater Accra and greater Kumasi areas for just three weeks, uh, we were not capable of containing that beyond that. So the businesses suffered, our livelihoods were threatened and relationships uh, you know, suffered. And we know that human beings, we are social animals. And once you, you create problems around this, it generates a lot of uh, response. And we saw a lot of pushback from various populations across the globe. Surprisingly, even much more forceful in the much more developed world. So a policy seeking to protect human populations under these kind of circumstances should be welcomed by all rational agents. Now the challenge we have is a rational policy makers policy options must necessarily under this kind of conditions be guided by the medical and scientific evidence available uh, in respect of the, this existential threat in the form of a pathogen called COVID-19. So those were the responses. Now, <clears throat> In policy making and ethical legal considerations, 
when there's certainty, both reasonable certainty in scientific and medical knowledge, and then risk profiling is good in the public health sense, then arguments about medical or social or public benefits or utility of vaccines and vaccinations as invaluable public or social goods become unassailable. And there's, we have a plethora of policy, legal, and ethical conversations around that. So this is a settled uh, position. But colleagues, hmm, uh, in the case of COVID-19, is there certainty or uncertainty? So where there exists significant <laughs> or reasonable scientific or medical uncertainty, risk profiling itself becomes a complex and often unclear phenomenon. And those kind of circumstances, it may not be immediately clear whether vaccines or vaccinations are a valuable public or social good. And as such arguments about their social or public utility become much contested issues. And therefore, they ought to be carefully tempered on the pain of irrationality. And that is where as professionals, as policymakers, we need to be careful to tread that path and act to avoid politics rather than science informing our public health policy or response. So in the midst of uncertainty, then critical ethical legal questions will emerge. The first one is what will be the legitimate public health responsibilities of a, pub a public policy maker? And how will that sit in the wake of individual rights and interests? And in the mix of these considerations, what are the social and distributive justice issues? So should we say that vaccines must be made compulsory? And who should, who, who should be compelled? Is it everyone or some persons? Are these mandates ethical, legal? Are they also legal? If they are even ethical, are they legal? If they are legal, are they ethical? So we'll have a conversation around that. And then I hope that when we get to the discussion component, then if there are unresolved matters, we will deal with them. But we are going to look at the ethics around whether we should mandate or not mandate vaccination. And this is important because we need to situate it that generally when we offer vaccinations, they are given voluntarily. And this is often based upon the presumption that moral agents will act to further their morally justifiable interests. And where a moral agent chooses not to do so, his or her competently exercised choice should not be disturbed. Remember, this is a presumption, and therefore this presumption may be rebutted. And one of the ethical grounds under which this presumption may be rebutted is when we are dealing with a public health event of international concern. When a competently exercised or expressed choice presents real and serious imminent harm to third parties, what should the reasonable policy maker do? This is the foundational ethical legal question that presents itself when we have this conversation. So it is no longer just whether or not we should disturb or not disturb, but if your expressed or exercise choice imposes real serious imminent harm to a third party, what should be the responsibility of a rational policy decision maker?
this presents a foundational question and that question has various forms i present to you only three different versions of the same question which is one version is is it ethically or legally permissible to have a government enforced mandatory vaccination program put another way should governments force people to vaccinate themselves and their children or are mandatory vaccinations an unjust infringement or unjust infringements of individual individual liberties rights and interests are they an unjust and the operative word is on unjust infringement now one of the strongest positions where claims are made that mandating public health measures under these kind of circumstances are an unjust infringement of public liberties come from a political, philosophical, theoretical viewpoint referred to as libertarianism. And the libertarian objection is particularly pungent. I must indicate before I go into the details and I'm, I'm trying to be deliberately light is that there's no unitary, single, simple theory or principle or group of principles on which all libertarians or those outside the American context call themselves liberals agree on. Some of these liberals may be committed in their ethical, legal, or moral, or ethical thinking or philosophical exploration to the Aristotelian kind of thinking. We can have people committed to John Locke's kind of theoretical exposition, and they are all claiming to be libertarians. And one of the modern proponents is Robert Nordic. Then we have people who claim to be libertarians, but are committed to the natural rights theoretical explore, explorations. And of course, we have consequentialists who claim uh, to also be libertarians. And the modern day consequentialists or utilitarians who are uh, in this mix will be Russian, John Rawls and co. Now at the central position of this theory is that they believe that individuals, and that is where the operative word is, they believe that individuals and not states or groups of any other kind are both ontologically and normatively primary. So it is the individual that is the most vulnerable entity in any moral consideration. And that individuals have rights against certain kinds of forcible interference on the part of other individuals. And they claim that liberty, when understood as a form of non-interference, is then the only thing that can be legitimately demanded of others as a matter of both legal and political rights. It is very important to catch the foundation. So all the arguments you have in the media uh, will be centered around this kind of claim. And their claim is that social order is not at odds with, but rather it devolves out of the individual liberty that the only proper use of coercion is when it is used in defense or to correct or rectify an error. And that governments are bound by essentially the same moral or ethical principles as individuals. And for them, the most existing and historical government, they claim, have acted improperly insofar as they have either utilized coercion for plunder, to attack only political opponents, and to create unnecessary aggression, or to force redistribution of resources, or for other purposes beyond the protection of an individual's liberty, then we should not trust governments to use force under this kind of circumstances. And therefore, if we ask government to mandate, for example, max or mandate vaccines, then we'll be making a grave error 
in ethics, and, and then correlatively in law. But we'll try to peel it down a little bit more. It will seem that on the surface of it, this liberal or libertarian objection works very well in the case of a competent adult and about their entitlement to make irrational, even self-destructive choices that may occasion their own death. But it is however not as obvious that the state cannot force parents or guardians to vaccinate their children for the good of the children. And that is because I'm not going to go into the exploration of the theories of rights, which is a very complex ethical, legal, philosophical mix outside the scope of this conversation we are having this afternoon. But to just say that we may classify rights in different forms. And one of the forms in which we classify rights are negative rights and positive rights. So children have negative rights. So we, we say you, you have a right of life, okay? It is a positive right. It means that governments has an obligation or a third party has an obligation to ensure you have life. life. Negative rights are you cannot deprive a child of medical treatment solely on grounds of religion. It's a negative right. It tells you not that you cannot do. It disables you. It, it creates an inability to be able to do something because of the rights. Of course, we have different classifications and I'll not go further. But just to say that in the case of children, and it's common practice. And that is the foundation of the jurisprudence in which we then say that we don't allow parents to make matters of their children. After all, these children may even grow up and not believe in what you believe in. But I'm going to activate three arguments to show why this kind of position does not sufficiently provide an ethically sustainable justification, okay? Or as an effective argument against coercive use of force to mandate vaccines. The first one is the key ethical legal principle of harm to others or to third parties. And the central claim is that those who are anti-vaccine or non-vaxxers, they harm and impose real and serious risk to their neighbors. And this is a recognized justification, both ethically and legally, for the use of the coercive power of the modern day state. However, our, our colleagues here, and especially those of us in public health, <laughs> will immediately see that it creates a problem. We have a concept of herd immunity in public health response to the pandemic, which means inherently that we don't expect every single person to be immunized. We don't expect everybody to be vaccinated. We just expect to have in most cases, I'm not sure whether I have qualifications at all to talk about this, but in most cases, we are looking about 80% and above coverage of the entire community we are dealing with to achieve herd immunity, depending upon what the composition and the state of the vaccine is. So in that light, then non vaccines might be distinguishable, at least theoretically, from bioterrorists who are intentionally seeking to infect other persons. And that presents a challenge in arguing that they Im impose harm. And I'll come and deal with that in the last point. But just keep at the back of our minds that if you are not expecting all of us to be vaccinated, it means that if I am not vaccinated and the 80% are vaccinated, it does not add an additional problem. It does not stop us from achieving herd immunity. But the other way, if I'm not vaccinated and then I'm going to be susceptible to the virus and then I can I've infect so many people, then it becomes a collective issue because you cannot single only divine out. It will be the collections of the divines, the group of divines who remain unvaccinated. 
And that leads us to the third argument, which I'll come to presently. The second ethical legal objection is that the whole principle of being a free rider on public goods is something that it is ethically and legally objectionable. The same way that tax avoidance is considered morally objectionable, you avoid the harms or burdens of a risk, but then you are willing to share in the benefits. And this is generally morally objectionable. So it based upon the free rider principle or harms to third parties, others principle, the liberal argument fails, but not so quickly. Brennan advanced an effective argument in his work in 2016, activating what we call the clean hands principle. And this deals with the problem of collective harms. And under this principle, it may be a defensible act to ethically enforce an obligation. Okay? And force people that if you are going to be involved in a collective harmful activity, then that would not be morally justifiable. So people have an obligation not to participate in a collectively harmful activity. And I'll give a practical example. Imagine that we have, somebody has captured divine and there are 20 people who will shoot and kill me. And they will all shoot at the same time. And there are 20 bullets who hit me at the same time. One bullet is sufficient for me to die. Therefore, the other 19 bullets are not necessary. But the other 19 are participating collectively in the activity of killing me. Imagine that they, you are a passerby and they add you as the 21st person and say that, let us pull our triggers. And under this, let all con conditions held constant, all the 21 bullets will hit me at the same time. So even though it's a collective action, the 21st bullet does not contribute to killing me. It doesn't. But we will still claim that this, there is something ethically, intrinsically unethical about this. For me to participate, after all, I know that uh, my bullet is not going to kill. But nonetheless, I become the 21st person and we all pull the triggers and instead of 20 bullets, 21 go into me. And this is a very forceful argument. One of the central claims of these libertarians is that governments fail. And that's why they cited, if you go back to the theory they were talking about, both historical and present governments have failed. They have used power in the wrong way to, to support their allies. And their main issue is that if we allow the coercive power of the state in controlling. So this state is the one that controls medicines, licenses who gets them. And it is the same state that says everybody must take the medicines. Then this might lead to what we call rent seeking behavior but by big pharmaceutical companies where they may bribe governments to undertake coercive actions when they are not needed. And that governments may use this power then in turn to reward donors and their allies at the expense of the common good. And therefore they activate what we call the public choice theory, which then says that we have to be cautious. We have to adopt the cautious approach when we are thinking about giving governments coercive power to be used against us. But, the interesting talk is that the libertarians are committed to the neoliberal capitalist theories. And therefore they will argue that markets should then be allowed to do the work. But the argument is that just as government fails, so do markets. And market failure without governmental intervention may even be catastrophic. So they have to go and come back. The second and foundational issue is that there's no current evidence 
to show that government failure is associated with compulsory vaccinations whatsoever. No evidence presented, it is an assertion and in ethical legal argumentation, that is not sufficient. But their biggest problem is the scenario I created about 20 people killing me at the same time, pulling the trigger at the same time, the bullets hitting me at the same time. And you becoming the 21st person to join. Your 21st, your 21st bullet does not determine the outcome of what happens to me. In fact, the first bullet determines. It doesn't matter. So this in philosophical argumentation, we call it the problem of the overdetermined harmful collective actions. So if we take that, if you collectively participate in a harmful activity that is overdetermined, then this may be morally or ethically unjustifiable. And it is very important. Even though your additional bullet does not, we will find it morally objectionable to be added as the 21st person to shoot, pull the trigger and kill this poor divine. Now, we can make an analogous argument by saying that refusing vaccination, even though your single refuser may not necessarily make any significant contribution to the harms that will come from all of you who are unvaccinated, you become like the 21st person in the shooting scenario. And therefore participating in a collectively harmful overdetermined activity will arguably be morally indefensible. But to argue this way does not mean that then go ahead and go and decree mandatory vaccinations. In fact, for any rational policy maker, mandates become the last resort. And we may get into more of this when we get into the conversation aspect. So just to touch on other perspectives that ethicists can come from, we have a group of ethicists called consequentialists. And the foremost consequentialist theory is what we know today as utilitarianism. And there are different forms of uh, utilitarianism. We have the classical, we have the rule, and then we have the preference. But classically, consequentialists will argue against participating in a collective activity that harms a greater majority of our people because at the core of classical uh, utilitarianism is hedonism, which says that we act to maximize happiness. And by happiness is meant pleasure. So any act that undermines happiness in the system does not maximize happiness. That action is not a good action. And if it's not a good action, then it is not the right action. If it's a good action, then it is the right action. If it's the wrong, if it's a bad action, then it is the wrong thing to do. So art utilitarians might hold that it is ethically wrong to participate in acts of collective harmful activities as they yield these utilities on the balance of all things considered. The rule utilitarians will argue that the correct moral principle is one that when we internalize as a majority of us will yield as a whole the best overall consequences. And preference utilitarians will argue that it is morally wrongful to prefer imposing collective harms on others as that will undermine our overall collective utility. So that is the basis of why that theory is called utilitarianism. Now, for those who are committed to Immanuel Kant's theoretical exploration, in his groundwork of uh, the metaphysics of morals, he will, they will argue that it will be unlikely that freely participating in an overdetermined harmful activity is capable of being universalized under 
the Kantian moral normative framework, and therefore will be something that will be ethically unsustainable. And a group of ethicists we call communitarians, and I use and I other this framework because our sub-Saharan African continent, we are communitarian in nature, and our basic social cultural settings are underpinned by a very strong principle of collective solidarity. So you will even find that in Ghana, in our healthcare sector, the whole CHIPS initiative or strategy was constructed and the harnessing the collective solidarity of our people through the spirit of volunteerism. And that is why we have NOBA or communal labor as something that can even be litigated at, at the level of custom. So under customary law, if you fail to participate in the NOBA, you could be brought and then uh, you know, punished before court and punished. So communitarians will argue that, that it, it is unlikely to hold that this kind of individualistic, we, we, what uh, Mark Fison uh, refers in her brilliant work as possessive individualism, that it is atomistic, it is egocentric and individualistic to say that you have freedom to participate in collective overdetermined acts that impose significant serious imminent harms on the polity, in the, on the community, on the family, on society and that any such claim will be morally indefensible. And this is very important to note because communitarians do not focus just on individual rights per se, but look at individuals as individuals in the collective of a community. And so we pursue in acting to pursue communal goals. And that is where the foundation of a lot of our quarantine and mandatory rules in public health measured responses uh, take their, their root form. So to, to be clear, the use of coercive power of the state is usually premised on the assumption that there is evidence that the intervention that you are mandating is going to be effective, that it has low incidence of side effects, that it protects reasonably well, and that this intervention is widely available. So if all of these four factors pertain, then it becomes epistemically irrational for anybody to dispute the value of a mandate. Colleagues, but, but, just but, can we confidently say so for SARS-CoV-2 vaccines? Can we confidently say so? Based upon the science we have for SARS COVID 2 vaccines. I move for us to point. I know that the lecture was on the ethics, but now we don't do ethics alone because laws, foundations are ethical in nature. And therefore, I will point us to what Ghana's law says. Ghana's law. <clears throat> mandates vaccines in section 22 of part two of the Public Health Act of 2012, Act 851. It specifically provides for compulsory vaccinations in section 22. In fact, section 21.2 provides exceptions and it provides only two exceptions, that if the vaccine may be injurious to one's health and that the person already has natural immunity. Now, think carefully about it. When you're going to mandate, are you going to be able to isolate the ones with already natural immunity? As for those that it will be injurious to, the law provides how we can identify those ones. Then in section 23, it provides a complete section on vaccination of adults. Then section 23, Four, provides for vaccination of children. Remember, when I was making the argument, I, I indicated that ethically, it would be problematic to indicate that even under a libertarian framework, that it would be unethical to forcefully vaccinate children. And this is provided for, and I'll reference Article 28.4 of the 1992 Constitution, and I'll, I'll come there uh, shortly. 
Section 25 of the Public Health Act provides the power of entry to public health officials. In fact, under normal vaccination periods, there's a requirement that you can actually agree with people who are in any house or home and negotiate when you can come between the hours of 6 a.m. in the morning and 6 p.m. in the evening. But the law specifically says that this power of negotiation is waived when we are dealing with pandemics like COVID-19. Then in section 26, it provides specifically for vaccinating travelers who cannot prove that they are already vaccinated. And that is very important. A lot of the things that are being done are not things that are done outside the law. In section 27, there is a requirement, there's an obligation placed by law, passed by our own sovereign parliament, for unemployers that they must notify authorities of entry of immigrants if those immigrants are employees of theirs coming to work. And in section 28, there is a requirement that we should provide certificates for persons who are vaccinated. So when we are worried about immunization or vaccination certificate, we actually have a law that was passed in 2012, which anticipated that and has made provisions for that. In section 29, our Public Health Act completely applauds inoculation as a means of trying to build people's immunity. And in section 31, it makes provisions for a long list of regulations that the Minister of, for Responsible for Health is supposed to be put in place. In fact, to indicate the time and places where the vaccinations are supposed to take place, what evidence that you can show to show that you have attended, and then regulations on vaccine supply. So the supply chain must be clearly regulated through regulations. And there's even a provision for a legislative instrument on follow-up of persons who may develop adverse reactions and then the appropriate management of those amongst a whole lot of things. Now, colleagues, I will draw our attention to section 168 as intimately connected with the drafting, in fact, from uh, zero to the full law of this law. And we attached in section 168 World Health Organization's International Health Regulations of 2005. In fact, the only health treaty we have, which has more signatories than the Human Rights uh, United Nations uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights Act. And this is attached as Shadow 7 to Act 851, the Public Health Act. Now, the important thing here is that Ghana is a dualist state in law, and the jurisprudence of dualism is that if Ghana goes to sign an international treaty, it does not confer on people, persons resident in Ghana the right to assess any rights or, or obligations or duties placed on the state of Ghana, unless those laws are incorporated into the domestic laws of Ghana. So to be clear, the International Health Regulations of 2005 of the WHO are now part of Ghana, Ghana's domestic law. And I just want to highlight a few points in Article 31. Just a moment, let me get some water. Thank you for your kind indulgence. Now, Article 31 provides that state parties have the right to require people to undertake medical examinations and vaccinations. And by February 1st of 2022, Austria will be mandating vaccines. Indonesia is, is already done that since uh, March this year. Saudi Arabia is in the same bracket. UK has already mandated specific uh, uh, healthcare workers and others. France has done the same. In fact, UK has also done so for care home persons and things like that. And then public service, US has done that for all public service officials and healthcare workers and things like that. And uh, I heard uh, the director general, my own brother, indicate that Ghana at the end of uh, this month, 
if you are not vaccinated, then we, mandates may come in. The same Article 31 provides that state parties may compel travelers to be vaccinated, may compel compulsory vaccination. But what they provide for is that this must be done with sensitivity, courtesy, and respect. Courtesy and respect to the travelers, especially with respect to our diverse gender, ethnic, religious, and social cultural concerns, etc. And this is important. So even at the level of the international, uh, you know, cooperation, all these states that are mandating are not doing something that is contrary to at least the WHO's international health regulations, provided they can provide sufficient justification. But the ground norm of laws in Ghana is the constitution of 1992. And in there, the constitution provides certain rights. In Article 31.1, it provides for the right to life. Now, one of the things that we will notice is that when we say something is a legal right or an um, ethical or moral right, legally, a legal right requires an obligation. Apart from creating an inability, it also creates, creates an obligation on others not to interfere in that right. And we are granted rights to our personal liberties. So nobody can come and try to snoop onto my phone to know where I am going and tra be tracking where I am going to listen to my conversation and then to try to record me when I'm calling you on um, phone, when you haven't told me that you're going to put me on last speaker, you put me on last speaker and some other person's here. In Article 15.1, the Constitution is very strong on the inviolability of human dignity. And if you forcefully, you know, inject people, will that be counted as a violation of human dignity? In Article 18.1, we provide for privacy of home, property, and communication, like I said, and correspondence. So you don't intercept somebody's email. And like I know some prominent media houses which will claim that they have intercepted. You cannot do that. Uh, the laws of Ghana, the constitution, at least creates, you know, responsibilities on others. And Article 28.4 that I hinted about prohibits all of us, including the state, from depriving children of medical treatment, education, and other things. But I took medical treatment only for our purposes, solely on the grounds of religion. Now, what we need to be clear is that all of these liberties or rights, claim rights, if you want to call them, have what we call clawback clauses. So none of them is absolute. So there are clawback clauses that where the, the infringement or interference with the right will be for public safety, will be for public health or public morals, for defense, prevention of crime, you can go on this thing. The state can do that. The state under our constitution can mandate, can interfere with rights when it properly evokes its powers. I put sections 169 to indicate that under the Public Health Act, the Minister of Health is clothed with statutory power to be able to declare a public health emergency. In the context of COVID-19, we noticed that the declaration of a public emergency was by His Excellency the President. Maybe that because it's a, you know, it was a global thing, nobody was sure. They wanted to elevate it at the level of the presidency and therefore it led to the uh, you know, uh, Emergency Powers Act of 20, uh, you know, uh, 20 Act 10, 12, and then the numerous executive instruments that have come from that. But our Public Health Act was adequate to be able to respond to the emergency. And in Section 170, the emergency powers that can be exercised are indicated there. And under those, information reporting and notification requirements are given in Section 171. And Section 172 grants immunities and indemnities 
to all of us who will be public health officials who may be infringing on people's rights or destroying properties. In fact, under this act, you can actually go and burn down whole streams of properties if we think that by so doing, that is the most effective way of controlling uh, the harm that is threatening the entire country. But the, there are provisions and requirements for adequate compensation. Then in, nine, uh, in section 173, there's a coordinated approach provided for in the act. Unfortunately, when I was just going through it, I noticed that ah, uh, it appears to limit our coordination to NADMO and public sector agencies only. But colleagues, you will agree with me that the contribution of the private sector in our COVID-19 response has been exemplary. And therefore, I don't think it was the proper intent of the legislators to exclude private sector uh, participants. Of course, we know that it's easier to coordinate public sector agencies effectively than private ones. But our experience has shown that it is not impossible. And of course, if you breach any of the requirements provided for in the act, then you may be convicted to either three months imprisonment or to 50 penalty units. One penalty unit is 12 CDs. So you can do the mathematics for yourself or you go to prison for three months or to both. And if you continue to refuse, if, for example, if you are a compulsory vaccination and you continue to refuse, the number of days you continue to refuse, it, you attract additional 10 uh, penalty units. So a few concluding thoughts. Vaccine certification or immunity certificates are a judgment about risk which are then turned into just a binary, given a binary value. Either you are specifically permitted or specifically excluded. And this binary value has significant political consequences. Because it may exclude you from participating in public goods. I may undermine your vulnerability or increase your vulnerability. Social justice concerns remain because if you mandate vaccines, then there are serious questions that are going to be raised about the social and distributive justice. That people pre-ordered vaccines even before they were made and hijacked vaccines that were meant for some other areas. Even before vaccines were pro, uh, even uh, approved and certified as effective, some countries had already pre-ordered. Pre-ordering vaccines, apart from the issues of inequity and unfair distributive justice issues there, was it out of selfishness or prudent investment? Because if you undermine the social and distributive justice things, then an unfair burden is then placed upon the most vulnerable who will then be further marginalized, excluded, and seriously disadvantaged. And that is why our country, our continent, that produces only one to 2% of its own vaccines, uh, it ran into serious challenges because those who were making them were hijacking them for their own populations. Forgetting that in a public health emergency of this nature, a pandemic of this nature, unless all is protected, none is actually really protected. So from Delta, we have come to Omicron. We don't know whether Lambda is following or uh, uh, Eulopsin or whatever is following. So we'll see. Now, the other point I wish to touch on briefly is that regulation of testing and certification technologies and is key and absolutely necessary to redress the effects of these technologies and ensure that they are used responsibly. And of course, public dialogue on how vaccine mandates promote public good in our various diverse communities, homes, you know, villages, towns, cities, must be something that should be encouraged to see where we are. So we are saying that, to be clear, government may legitimately use coercive measures such as vaccine or max mandates during 
the management of a public health event of international concern aimed at preventing harm to others. But for that kind of force to be legitimate, ethically speaking, the following four conditions must be met. Firstly, the problem has to be significant. So you have to have a grave emergency or real risk of harming people. It's no doubt that COVID-19 presents that. Secondly, you have to have a safe and effective intervention. Safe and effective intervention. The scientific question is out there whether or not the various variants, mutations of COVID-19, whether existing vaccines are effective interventions against those. We saw promising news. I think it was from Pfizer. We are waiting to hear from the rest. Thirdly, on the balance, the outcome has to be better than the fewer liberties and more restrictive measures. Remember that the ultimate objection of libertarians that the vaccine mandates will be taking your rights away, physical dissenting did that. Closing of businesses did that. <laughs> so it's not unique to vaccines. Okay, when we say you must wear face masks, it did that. They are all liberty restricting or limiting interventions. Fourthly, the level of coercion has to be proportionate to the level of risk and the safety and effectiveness of the intervention that is under consideration. So government enforced coercive and liberty limiting regulatory actions are part and parcel of our modern existence. And we can't run away from it. Consequently, it is my case that state enforced vaccine mandates may be ethically defensible. And I've tried to show that even so under a libertarian ethical legal framework. I've pointed to us that the laws of Ghana, the constitution, the statutes, and even case law in their current form support mandatory vaccinations when properly invoked. And once again, I've tried to make it clear that we need to always remember that vaccine mandates are not our only instrument of last resort, especially when our knowledge of the vaccine protection, the effectiveness of that is in the flux. I thank you very much and let the conversation begin. I thank you, Divine, for, for that um, presentation. We, we are actually at the time that this was supposed to end. <clears throat> but then there have been a number of comments where people have um, are stating that they've been, they've been a useful presentation and, and all that. There aren't, there aren't any major questions in the, in the question and answer, answer section. Um, section. Let me see, there are about seven things then. Now let me just have a look and see what, what, what's there. Okay, so there's, there's, there's one question there that I would, I would, um, I, I, I would read. What's happening here? This chat things are getting okay. in the way. Yes, I, I can see it here. Uh, Prof, there is one yes, question, it, if you can hear yeah. me. Yeah, it says, Prof, doesn't uh, a mandatory law on vaccination deny one the right to choose or refuse treatment? That's one of the questions. That if we have a mandatory law on vaccination, doesn't it deny a person the right to choose or refuse treatment? Would you like to comment on that? We can only take a few comments because time is up here. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. I think uh, that is so. It denies, but the point I'm making is that autonomy is of uh, is not an absolute concept. Right. And if it is ethically defensible that is a justifiable infringement of on that right. You don't have, whilst you have a right for your autonomy to be respected, you have no right to impose intentional harm on another party because that is another right. So it's about weighing the impact of rights. And usually that is where the state intervenes. Nobody has a right to come to your house and seize your property. 
they are okay. ethically approved methods of acquiring property and not to come at the dawn of night with a cutlass or gun and seize your property. So that would be infringement upon the person's liberties to be free and move about. There's another question that's asking whether people have a right to choose a certain vaccine over others. Uh, that is a distributive question. If the vaccines are available, maybe that right may be provided because uh, uh, the choice will be determined by the resources available. And we are in a resource constrained environment where most of our vaccines are actually dependent upon donations and gifts. And therefore it is very unlikely that somebody can assert a right to choose a particular vaccine, even though based upon the health considerations, some vaccines may be better for some people than others, but definitely not a right properly or legally so-called. Okay. And um, there's this question, which I think is based on an assumption, <laughs> saying that what should individuals who had adverse reactions to the first dose do, since they are being mandated to take their second shots? I wonder whether it is really true to say that people are mandated to take their second shots even when they've had adverse reactions. I think, I think that's a wrong assumption because certain actions are taken when the person reports an adverse reaction and appropriate advice is given. Divine, what do you have to say to that? Absolutely. If you check in the Public Health Act, I indicated that one of the legislative instruments to be passed is to deal with follow-ups and adverse effects and then the appropriate management. And therefore, there can be no man. Currently, we don't have a mandate yet in Ghana to start with. The, it is only encouraged and advised that you take a second dose. But there's no mandate to start with as a matter of law. But the second point is that even the Public Health Act recognizes that when people have adverse effects, they are dealt with differently. And the law makes provision for that. Right. So there are... But there are a number of questions, but but at time at time is at time is up now. We can't really take um take take um all of these. Um, I guess the what I see as the main thrust of what Dr. Banibala has presented is that legally, I mean the the government can mandate vaccination. However, it's not a thing that should be done lightly, and the same law that gives the government the power to mandate. Um, vaccination also provides, um, let's say, limits or guidelines that the government needs to make sure are satisfied before, before um, mandating vaccination. So it's not as if once the government mandates it, I mean, it's, it's correct. There are things to do to, things that need to be covered before that is done. So, um, Divine, you've seen a number of the questions there. I'll, I'll just give you like a minute to make some closing remarks, then we, then we close. Yeah, Prof, I think that uh, you have uh, uh, provided an effective summary. The, the key point is that there are ethical and legal justification currently in our framework to be able to mandate. But certain conditions have to be met before those things will be ripe. You have to invoke the law the right way, and you have to ensure that certain conditions are met before you can ethically invoke. So the first question is there, can we then say government can bind it? The four points are provided. If we can be sure that all the four key conditions are met in terms of whether we are certain about the effectiveness of the intervention, especially when our knowledge, and then there's inadequate social uh, uh, and distributive justice issues where there are not even uh, enough vaccines. And then, of course, if they are going to be mandated, there must be specific exceptions which are recognized in the other laws to avoid a situation of conflict of laws. So the question as to whether or not uh, Ghana is mandated is still out there for us to be answered. That is a way of avoiding to answer the question for all of us, but to say that it can ethically, as a matter of legal principle or ethical principle, the government can mandate, and we can find resources to be able to justify that mandate. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. And I guess one benefit of, of this COVID-19 pandemic is that we've all 
benefited from this lecture because we have over a thousand participants. And if, if we're doing wow. this face to face, we're doing this face to face in our auditorium. I mean, people would spill out on the stairs into the atrium and they wouldn't be able to do it. Or that even have been a, a bigger scramble to register. So, so that this has been a great participation. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Dr. Banyubala, for giving us this insightful lecture. So enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you very much for the opportunity.